Welcome to Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on social media and wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is supported by our Patreon supporters and by Rocky Bluffs. Tonight, we'll read another chapter from the book Bird Watching, published in 1901 by Edmund Sellis, titled Watching Gulls and Skewas. If you enjoy this episode, please be sure to listen to our Blackbirds episode and the Watching Birds from a Haystack episode from this series as well. The author started as a conventional naturalist of his time, but Celis developed a hatred of the common practice at the time of killing animals for scientific study and was a pioneer of bird watching as a method of scientific study. The author was a solitary man and was not well known in ornithological circles. He avoided both the company of ornithologists and reading their observations so as to base his conclusions entirely on his own observations. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Gulls and skewers are best watched on some lonely island where they breed, and thither we will now transfer ourselves. They breed together in the same grounds, and more than half of the whole island, all that part where it is a peaty waste, clothed with a thin brown heather, is now, in early June, their assembly ground and prospective nursery. The gulls are in much the greater numbers, and all of them here are of the black-backed species, mostly the lesser of the two so named, but with a fair sprinkling of the greater black-backed also. Lying down and sweeping the distance with the looking glasses, for near they have risen and float overhead in a clamorous cloud, one sees everywhere the bright white dottings of their breasts, soft gleaming amidst the uniform brown of the heather. They are not at all crowded, but scattered widely about at irregular and, for the most part, considerable intervals. There is rarely a group and though many pairs may be seen standing closely together, yet this is the exception rather than the rule. Most birds of such pairs as are present are some three or four to a dozen or twenty yards apart, whilst the greater number of the whole assembly stand singly the bird nearest to each, at a much greater distance, being one of another pair. This is because the partner birds are for the time being absent, but every now and again one may be seen to fly up and join the solitary one, whilst, similarly, one of a couple will from time to time fly off and leave the other alone. Thus, though the eye will distinguish at any time many paired couples, to the majority of the birds it will not be able to assign a partner 
with certainty. But this varies very much. On some occasions, there will be many more close couples than on others. And it is when this is the case that the gullery has the most pleasing appearance. Here and there, one sees a bird, not standing, but couched closely down amidst the heather. These birds have laid and are now hatching their eggs. For the most part, they are alone, but as the season advances and they become more and more numerous, the partner may often be seen standing near the nest and presenting every appearance of a joint interest and proprietorship in it. When a bird flies up to its partner, it usually comes down close beside it. The two will then be together for a while, but soon they either walk or fly to a little distance from one another. After remaining apart for a longer or shorter time, they visit again, then again separate. So they continue to act at longer or shorter intervals till one of them flies off to sea. This system of making each other little visits and then going away and remaining for some time apart seems a feature of the gull tribe generally, and it is particularly marked in the case of the great skua. A pair of these birds will each have its apartments, so to speak, and, by turns, each will be the caller on or the receiver of a call from the other. Either one will walk or fly directly over to where the other is standing or reclining, or it will make several circling sweeps before coming down beside it, or else, for this is another fashion, each of them will set out to call on the other and, meeting in the center between their respective places, have their gossip there. However the meeting takes place, when the birds are together, one of them will commonly bow its head down toward the ground in a heavy sort of manner, whilst the other stands facing it with the head and bill lifted into the air. All at once, one of the birds Usually, I think, the caller, if either has remained at home, turns round, raises its wings above its back, and, holding them thus, makes a heavy sort of spring or running leap forward along the ground. This is done several times lowering the wings each time that it pauses and raising them again to make the leap. From this, it might be thought that the bird flew rather than leapt. But this, when I saw it, did not appear to me to be the case. It did not fly but only jumped with the wings held up. The birds are now apart again as before, but after a short interval, the one that has behaved in this odd way returns, and they again stand vis-a-vis, -vis, 
regarding each other, but this time without so much bowing or raising of the head. Then, one of them, and I think it is the same one, turning as before, there is almost an exact repetition. And this may take place some three or four times in the course of an hour. The two will then often take wing and fly for a while together, sometimes over the sea, but more often in a series of wide circles round and about their home. They are masters of flight, and, after two or three flaps, will glide for long distances without an effort, alternately rising and sinking, varying their direction by a turn of the head or, as it seems, by presenting the broad surface of their wings to the different points of the compass and sweeping either with or against the wind, apparently with equal ease, or with the wind blowing violently, its normal state they will neither advance nor recede, and it is certainly a very surprising thing to see one of these great, somber plumaged birds hanging, motionless, or almost motionless, at but a foot or so above the long, coarse grass, which is being all the while bent and swayed in the direction towards which its head is turned. If it advances at all, it is against the bend of the grass. But though I have said that the great Skua is a master of flight, I have not yet termed its flight either graceful or majestic. For a long time, indeed, during which I had only seen it near its temporary home, I was unable to do so, not, at least, with a full conviction, for though I admired it, yet there seemed always to be in it some want which I felt was unable to define. It puzzled me, but at last I discovered what it was, and my discovery, which acquits the bird and is to the honor of its nature, I will give as I wrote it down directly after I had made it. One of the great skuas has now flown right out to sea. There its flight, which is peculiar, becomes instantly very graceful. Descending with a sweep, which, though majestic, is yet soft and gentle, it seems about to sink upon the waves when almost as it touches them, it glides again softly upwards to descend once more in the same manner. Thus, ever rising and sinking, seeming always about to rest, yet never resting, it glides tireless and seems to coquette with the sea. On land, too, 
these wide, circling sweeps had had a grace and charm, but it had not entirely pleased the eye. Something had been absent, but what that something was, it had been beyond me to say. Now, I knew it. What it wanted had been the illimitable plain of the ocean which, in a moment, took away all heaviness from the form and all harshness from the coloring. The somberness of the sea blends now with its own and the waves are moving with its own motion. All is in harmony. The picture has found its frame. Gulls, too, are more graceful when they sweep over the sea than the shore near it. They have then softness and expanse as a background. The latter, I think, is the more important and may be unconsciously demanded by association of ideas. Earth had not been wide enough for the great skewer. Often when one of the great skewers is circling round and the other standing at its post, this one will stretch itself up and raise its wings above the back every time its partner passes. This raising of the wings enters into one of the most salient of the many nuptial antics of this bird, which I will now describe. In its completest form, it commences aerially. The two birds have been circle soaring one above the other and are now at a considerable height above one of their chosen standing places when the lower one floats with the wings extended but raised very considerably, halfway perhaps, towards meeting over the back an action which, in their flight, is uncommon. As it does this, it utters a note like air, 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 upon which, as at a signal, the other one floats in the same manner, and both now descend thus together to the ground. Standing then, the one behind the other, at about a yard's distance and faced the same way, both of them throw up their heads, raise their wings above their backs, pointing them backwards, and stand thus for some seconds fixed and motionless, looking just like an heraldic device. At the same time, they utter a cry which sounds like, Skier! The foremost bird then flies off and is instantly followed by the other. If the wings were not extended, this pose would somewhat resemble that of the great plovers, for though the neck is stretched more forwards, it is curved in the same curious way, and the head, though held high, is bent toward the ground. The wings, however, give it quite a different character 
and I have, I feel sure, seen some figures of birds on a shield whose attitude bore a wonderful resemblance to that of the skuas. Sometimes during these visits that the birds pay to each other, the two will bend their heads down together and pick and pull at the grass. When they raise them, there may be a blade or two of it in the bill of one, which is allowed to drop in a negligent, desultory way. Or one, which I take to be the female, plucks up a tuft and walks with it to the male, as though to show him. She lets it drop and then both birds, standing front to front, lower their heads at the same time and utter a shrill, though not a loud cry. This seems as though one bird were suggesting to the other the propriety of building a nest, but it may be the actual manner in which the nest is built there would, of course, be no doubt as to this if the birds, one of them, were to continue thus to pluck and bring tufts or blades of grass. But this was never the case when I saw them, nor did I ever remark any action on their part that made the appearance of systematic nest building than this. The nest of the great skua is very slight, a mere pressed-down litter of coarse, long grass, shallow, and having a pulled, tattered look round the edges, suggestive of the crown of a shabby straw hat or bonnet from which the remaining portion has been torn. Compared to it, the nest of a gull, being formed of quite a considerable quantity of bog moss and heather, basin-shaped and fairly regular, and with well-formed, soft, cushiony rim all around it, is almost a work of architecture. Yet neither do gulls seem to work regularly or systematically in the building of their nests. One may be seen piking into the ground with its long, powerful beak, and then withdrawing it with a tuft of moss or a sprig of heather held between the mandibles. After making a few sedate steps with this, the bird lays it down, but instead of fetching some more now and continuing the work, it merely stands there and appears to forget all about it. Another will fly up with some material and, after circling a little above its partner on the ground, will alight and lay it down as a contribution beside it in a very stolid sort of way. The other bird does not help and does not seem particularly interested, and the two now stand side by side for about half an hour, when the one that has last arrived flies away, and on returning again, brings nothing. 
sometimes a gull may be seen walking with moss or heather in the bill whilst its consort walks beside it but without having anything when the heather is placed by the one bird the other stands by and seems interested but does not assist and no further supply is brought it would appear therefore that only one bird and this no doubt the female actually builds the nest though the other the male may look on and take a greater or less amount of intelligent interest in what she is doing but though the above is from the life it hardly seems possible that gulls could get their nest done at all if they worked no better than this when I first got to that island few eggs had yet been laid and many of the nests were only half finished or not even so far advanced as that most however were completed or nearly so and it is probable that what I saw represented merely the finishing touches what I saw was indeed very little and it is only a surmise that the female gull builds the nest without being aided by the male I think so however because usually when both the male and female assist in the building they work together and whilst collecting the materials keep more or less in each other's company arriving with them either at the same time or shortly after each other this at least has been the case with those birds which I have watched I have indeed seen two gulls pulling up the moss or heather within a yard or so of each other and these I at first put down as a married couple.